that one this I... is this is you can see that this is on Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's special symposium held by the Sadat Chair. My name is Greg Ball. I'm the Dean of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences here at the University of Maryland. And I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to today's event called Immigrant Stories. It's very appropriate that this event be today, which is Social Justice Day here at the campus, an event we started about three years ago in which we discussed different themes related to social justice. And I think immigration is one of the great challenges that any society faces, and it really tests the value system of how you can value your own, appreciate your own culture, but also welcome and appreciate, tolerate, embrace other cultures. And that continues to be a challenge for our species. Even in the United States, where we have a consensus that immigration has been fundamental to the success of the country, today we're still having a debate concerning the pros and cons of immigration and how it should be managed. And so this tension continues, and the resolution of this tension, in my mind, is going to be one of the most important things this country has to do in order to move forward with success and a healthy society. It's therefore wonderful that Professor Shibli Talhami, the Sadat Chair for Peace here at the University of Maryland, has sponsored today's event. Having a series of prominent people who went through the immigrant experience, talking about their experience, helping us to reflect on that and think about how we should learn from this, I think it's just a wonderful event to have as part of Social Justice Day. So, welcome, and I invite Professor Talhami to come to the stage. Well, thanks so much, Greg, and thank you all for coming. Uh, we're really in for a treat to, uh, this evening. Uh, we have um, a superb uh, panel uh, with fascinating stories and extraordinary accomplishments. Um, but before I get to the panel and um, we get into the conversation, um, I want to uh, thank uh, the Carnegie Corporation from New York, of New York for uh, co-sponsoring. We have a representative from Carnegie. Welcome uh, here. Carnegie, many of you know, uh, has been ex uh, uh, excellent in, in supporting research, including on this issue of immigration, supported many of us at the University of uh, of Maryland, uh, as well as uh, multiple other researchers. Uh, but they also have this uh, 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 annual uh, 
selection, which is called the Great Immigrants, uh, with, the, with the New York Times, uh, they, publish, they recognize accomplished immigrants, a wonderful program. In fact, a number of our panelists actually were selected uh, uh, for, the, for that program, and, and thank you for, for joining us. Um, I also want to recognize the Office of International Affairs on campus and Ross Lowen for uh, the whole series really of immigration as your idea and also uh, for um, uh, being co-sponsor of this event. Um, before I start the conversation though, uh, I would like to share with you some fresh data uh, on immigration. We just did, um, many of you may know, particularly our students here and faculty, um, that among other things, I also had a, a center uh, for public opinion, the University of Maryland's critical issue uh, poll, and my colleague um, Stella Rouse and I um, uh, um, usually are the principal investigators on mul multiple uh, polls every year. Uh, we have just finished a poll on immigration and refugees, and uh, in fact, um, we will be uh, releasing a study. We're in the middle of analysis, uh, but it's so fresh. Um, it, literally, the last day of actual polling was April 2nd, and we just spent the last few days uh, coming up with uh, something to show you. We only, I'm not going to take much time. It's just going to be five minutes or so to give you some of the fresh results. And it comes at a very timely moment because, as you know, um, there has been a uh, talk uh, with all the changes of Homeland Security that have taken place uh, over the past uh, few days and talk about doubling down on immigration policy, uh, possibly also doubling down on family separation policy. And so what we have done is ask some questions, of course not anticipating this was going to happen, but this is of course an ongoing issue that we have been uh, confronting. Um, so I'm going to just give you um, a sample of a few questions that are interesting uh, and maybe also we'll, we'll fold them into the conversation. Um, the, the survey itself is very, very large. We have multiple questions on refugees uh, as well on, as, as, uh, on immigrants and, and, and that study, the, the, the actual questionnaire is already posted online for those who are interested. Uh, you can go online and, uh, to our website and, uh, and follow that, but we're going to have an analytical study released pre pretty soon. So let me just uh, review some of those results with you. Just quickly about the methodology, we do all our polls with Nielsen Scarborough. It's a, uh, they have a probability uh, panel. We, we choose a, a national representative sample, in this case over 3,000. So it's a pretty significant sample. Uh, we were in the field for roughly about three weeks or so. Uh, and um, the margin of error is small, relatively small, 1.7%. So let me start with this question, first of all. Uh, do you approve or disapprove uh, of, um, um, of the current immigration raids that are being carried out across the country by federal immigration enforcement agents? So this is really strictly a question that is direct about um, the raids themselves. And I want you to note here that um, the it, it is the divide on this between Republicans and Democrats is so amazing. I often tell people that the divide in our country on some of those issues is much greater than the divide between America and the rest of the world. Uh, because, uh, and this, of course, tells you the story. I don't see it here for some reason. Um, why is this not? Uh, let me see if I can do it. Uh, It's, the clicker is not, uh, it was working, but I'm not sure what happened. Sorry about that. Okay, so I don't know why it's not, so why don't you just do this? Let's see if we can do it this way. It's not showing at all. Looks like it may not be connected. No, it is connected. Because we have this. Did you open a new one? Yeah. Sorry about that. We'll try to figure that out in a minute. So, uh, let me turn this other microphone on. At least I can, I can say something about it before we look at the data. Um, so, um, 
on this particular question, what's really uh, striking, if you look at the graph, which I hope you will see shortly, uh, you will notice that um, uh, it's just a huge difference between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, while over 80% of Democrats oppose the raids, over 80% of Republicans support the raids. That's, that's one of the issues uh, that have been kind of um, a um, very typical uh, in the United States today where it's all about identity politics, it's tribalism, because there's absolutely no way that this is an objective analysis of whether the raids are good or, or, or not. It's all about uh, is Trump supporting this or is Trump against it, and we see that. But despite that, what I want to show you is on some of the other issues we have, is it working now? Great, thank you. So what I want to show you, so here is this particular, uh, this particular slide, if you take a look. Um, it's, um, you know, um, approve the raids. Republicans is the red line. 88% of Republicans approve the raids. Uh, the blue line is the Democrats. 81% disapprove. And fascinating, the independents are like you know, divided down the middle. So in the end, when you look at the numbers, really you have a very much a, a divided America across the board on this issue. But that's not true of all issues. So I want to show you something else here. And so um, you look at this question, which comes closest to your view, regardless of the immigration raids being carried out. Uh, so we give them two options. The immigration raids are targeting all undocumented immigrants, regardless of whether they have a criminal record, or the immigration raids are only targeting undocumented immigrants, as some people have argued. Um, uh, and here, you actually have, interestingly, you know, a majority of Americans, 58%, uh, uh, say no, they're targeting everyone, including people who don't have criminal records. And even Republicans, look at the red line, it's actually divided among Republicans down the middle. 35% say, you know, everyone, 37% say only those with, with criminal records. So that's an interesting one where actually more Americans think everybody's being targeted. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting conclusion, especially in light of our debate. Uh, and then here, um, uh, would you say immigration helps the United States more than it hurts or the other way around? Uh, obviously, a, a, you know, a general question. But again, look at this, the, the divide here. Um, uh, you know, if you look at the black being the total, okay, the black is all Americans. 42% uh, say it helps more than it hurts. 24% say it hurts more than it helps. And then 34% say a little bit of both. But again, there's a divide, but it's not as big a divide as we have seen before. Uh, uh, you know, more Republicans say it hurts more than it helps, but you know, overall, um, I would say the people who say that it hurts more are few. Um, then we have this question, as you may know, when some families trying to enter the United States illegally at the southern border have been caught and detained, U.S. officials have separated parents from their children do you think this separation of parents and children is acceptable, unacceptable, or uh, haven't you heard enough about, about it to say? So here again, look at this. We have really very strong uh, 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 sense that it's unacceptable. Nearly two-thirds of America, 65%, the black uh, is all American. 65% say this is unacceptable. Uh, but it's also telling, nonetheless, that you got 49% of Republicans who say it's acceptable. All right, so in fact, it's a plurality of Republicans. Um, not quite as much support as Trump gets on other issues, but 34% uh, say unacceptable. Um, independents are more on the side of the Democrats. 68% um, say it's unacceptable. 18% say it's acceptable. Um, and then we asked a question, um, which really kind of a follow-up to this question, which is more about um, whether or not um, you know, theoretically, they want to see uh, priority given to keeping families together or priority given to prosecute uh, the immigrants. So again, it's another kind of philosophical way to get at this issue. And here again, you know, 56% majority say priority should be given uh, to keep families together, not to prosecute. Only 30% say priority should go to prosecute. But note again, that a majority of Republicans, 58%, as opposed to 24%, say priority should be given to 
prosecuting the immigrants not to family separation. Um, so one, one more question I want to show you. In general, do you think undocumented immigrants are more likely to commit crimes than American citizens? And now this is really an interesting question because in general, we have done questions related to this particularly about immigrants. And typically, American citizens exaggerate the number of crimes committed by refugees in particular. And we have done, in fact, in this study, we're gonna release some more on this, exactly how many people they think uh, 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 refugees have committed crimes. But in this particular case, uh, you can see we're, we're, we're asking this question with the backdrop of the president's campaign essentially saying we're keeping out criminals, right? This is, this is one of the main themes that's out there. But you know, it doesn't look like this is resonating. This is interesting because you've got 54% of Americans say that actually uh, it's not likely that immigrants are going to commit more uh, and undocumented immigrants, this is not just immigrants, this is about undocumented immigrants. And it's, it's unlikely that, that undocumented immigrants will commit more crimes than American citizens. And only 30% say, yes, uh, again, there's a Republican uh, majority uh, uh, who thinks that they will, but still not as big a majority as the rest of it. So um, there are obviously a lot more um, uh, results in, in, in the poll. I'm going to stop here just with those few because I want to uh, add these to the conversation. Uh, I welcome uh, the panelists to join us um, and then I'll introduce them uh, after they get uh, to the So please join us. Your names are uh, on the chairs and let me just go back to uh, this. Great. You're right. You can go right there. All right, welcome uh, to our panelists. Uh, let me just uh, very briefly introduce them. And part of the reason why I'm not going to go through a long introduction uh, is that I'm going to have them tell us their stories. Um, remember we called this um, um, immigrant stories in part because we want to tell the stories of immigrants and then have a conversation about it. And so I'm not going to do a long introduction. Uh, needless to say each one is extraordinarily accomplished. But let me start with um, my colleague Nina Khrushcheva, uh, who is a professor at the Graduate Program of International Affairs uh, at the New School. Um, she has written uh, many books. She has been a, a voice in, uh, in the public conversation. Many of you may have seen her on television or heard her commentary or read her op-eds. Incredibly thoughtful. I've always been a fan. We've been in touch uh, uh, over the years. Um, and more importantly, uh, with all the books that she has published, she still has a new book that just came out. And it is called In Putin's Footstep. Uh, footsteps searching for the soul of an empire across Russia's 11 time zones. Um, and it really gives uh, a flavor of the complexity of Russia and how uh, we, we don't uh, do, uh, deal with this issue adequately. This book um, with Jeffrey Taylor uh, literally came out a few weeks ago and it's available actually, we're gonna have a book signing for those of you who are interested uh, after this, uh, this uh, um, uh, panel. Um, next to um, Nina is our own uh, Wallace Lowe, our president. Um, many of you know his biography, uh, know his accomplishments, um, know his challenges uh, uh, that, that, that he has faced um, in many months, but many of you may not know the full story. Um, just like um, uh, Nina, who was uh, born um, uh, in, in Moscow uh, uh, during the Cold War, um, uh, and, and then found her way to this country. Uh, well, uh, President Lo was born in Shanghai, China. Um, also, you know, even just before the Cold War or just about the Cold War was uh, about to, to emerge and, and then uh, found his family found its way to Peru and then came to this country. So it's a, a powerful story uh, there and 
Maria Otero, who um, is um, maybe known to many as a, a relentless advocate of human rights um, in this country and around the world, uh, who served um, as Under Secretary of State um, for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights uh, in the Obama administration. She also was a special representative, uh, uh, Obama's special representative for Tibetan issues. Uh, and um, uh, one other thing about Maria is she is a, a Terp. She actually went to the University of Maryland, studied at the University of Maryland. Uh, really great to have you. Maria was born in, Bol in Bolivia. Uh, and then uh, last but not least, uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Abdurrahim Fukara, uh, who heads Al Jazeera in the Americas, in both South and North America, uh, and um, who um, uh, was born in Marrakesh, Morocco, um, he um, and I have known each other for a long, long time. Uh, normally, it's exactly the opposite way. Um, uh, he's, he's, he's interviewing me on um, Al Jazeera's uh, weekly show, Min Washington's, a one-hour show, uh, which gives the Arab world the flavor of what's happening in the United States. And so it's really representing America to the Arab world, and I have the pleasure of being his host almost at once a month, uh, it seems. Uh, sometimes even more frequently, depending on the issues. Um, uh, Abdurrahim has a, uh, an interesting story, not only in terms of growing up in Morocco, but also, uh, uh, like President Lowe, going somewhere else before he came to America, and that is uh, the UK. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and let me start with um, just your stories. Um, I have some you know, uh, questions I want to probe. Um, uh, but if you could tell us your story about how you, how you found your way here, um, and I, I mean, before I, you know, I, I, I ask this question because, frankly, um, everybody has a different path to coming here. Uh, some struggle more than others, some more natural than others, uh, but it's always an interesting path. And I also want to say, you know, especially because um, uh, these are extraordinary people by any measure that we have on this panel, uh, whether it's immigrants or not, whether it's Americans or, or internationals by virtue of their accomplishments and visibility, um, you know, I think that we should also recognize uh, that there are many immigrants who are invisible, uh, who have worked hard and contributed to America, who didn't quite uh, uh, become public figures, um, who contributed so much to this country. And so when we're thinking about immigrants, we're not only thinking about this kind of accomplishment that is visible and public accomplishment. And I feel like I have to say that because my wife and I were in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, uh, just a few weeks ago, less than a month ago, and we went to the Henry Ford Museum, and uh, we saw when the car industry started, all these immigrants that were being brought in, including a lot from the Middle East, Arab Americans that's to this day strong, but from all over. Uh, who, who put sweat and blood in to building the car industry uh, to make it as great as it was. And this is the story of a lot of people who um, remain unnamed in terms of uh, the public discourse, and they're great because they contributed. America is great not only because of people on this panel, but because of a lot of other immigrants uh, who, who, who don't have the same recognition and acceptance. And by the way, all these workers who, whose stories we heard when we were visiting uh, the car museum, they now have parents who are, in fact, um, people who would be here on this, on this uh, panel. Uh, and that, too, is really something, a story that has to be told. But we have those four on the stage. And I want to start with you, Nina, uh, because your, your story uh, is interesting. Uh, obviously, it comes at a time when there is a, when Russia is, uh, to be a Russian American at a time when, when we have a, a, a Russian American tension uh, has, has to be a story. So please start with the origins. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's very humbling to be here, and um, I'm very grateful to. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Humbling to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I feel like I don't deserve to be here, but here I am. Um, not because Russia is such a Darth Vader of contemporary foreign policy, 
mm-hmm. and politics. Uh, but that, that's, I guess, our fate. Um, being a Russian in this country is never easy. You're sometimes forgotten, as we were after 1991. And some Russianists complained about that, and I feel like that was a wonderful time. Nobody really cared that my name is Nina Khrushcheva in 1995. Well, not so much today. Um, My story is simple, I think. Uh, It's, I mean, thank you for saying it's interesting. I don't know how interesting it is. Uh, The Cold War was almost over. Mikhail Gorbachev was the general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, but he was so pro non communist, I think, a social democrat that he renamed himself into president, which is a little bit of an oxymoron in terms because there was also a communist party at the same time. I guess that happens. I mean, it happens in China. Uh, so, but at the time, it was an unusual thing. And uh, uh, he also said, we really cannot dictate uh, the world the fates, if they don't want to be with us, it was during the fall of the Berlin Wall in 89, if they don't want to be with us, um, they should pick their own story, they should pick their own fate. And he said to the Soviets, it's a free country, you do whatever it is you want to do. And so I thought, oh, that's interesting. I'd like to see how it is to be a foreigner, because the Soviet Union, with all its diversity, was a homogeneous country. You don't travel, you really don't meet that many foreigners, so I wanted to see how it is to be somewhere else, to be a Russian somewhere else. And so I applied for graduate school in a variety of places. My first choice was Princeton University. I was lucky to be accepted to Princeton University, and here I am. Uh, I've been here since 91. I never lived in Russia because I still left the Soviet Union. It was two weeks before the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, So uh, every time when I introduce myself, I say, hi, I'm a former Soviet. Yeah, and so um, kind of if you can just tell us a little bit more about your growing up in the Soviet Union at a time when there was the Cold War and how you grew up seeing America as on the other side, uh, and particularly with the legacy of your family, uh, because you have uh, obviously, um, you know, if you, uh, and, and not only is a great grandfather who, who was heading uh, the Soviet Union uh, at the time, but also who was, I understood in a way, an adoptive grandfather in, in practice, right, in, in your biography. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, thank you for this. So Nikita Khrushchev was my great-grandfather by blood and my grandfather by relations because when um, my mother's parents, his granddaughter's parents uh, were killed and imprisoned during World War II, he adopted her as a daughter, he and and, and Nina, who I named after. Um, So that's kind of the origins of that story. Um, The way I was growing up in the Soviet Union, I don't know how much of it is of interest. It is in some ways, I guess, an interesting story because the name is big, but the growing up was very small uh, because I was born uh, right when uh, Nikita Khrushchev was ousted from uh, being in charge of the Kremlin and uh, essentially became a persona non grata. So when I was growing up, there was no such thing as Nikita Khrushchev did anything. Sputnik, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Yuri Gagarin, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Uh, Meeting with with John Kennedy, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. So he really didn't exist because that was the Soviet politics is that you delete leaders that um, you are not, not you, the system deletes leaders that it is not happy with. So I grew up with a name that was also a non-existent name. Uh, I don't know how to explain it in five mm. seconds or less, but um, uh, everybody knew. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody knew that Khrushchev was a big name, and yet it was the name that was unpronounced. So I would come into school and be a Khrushchev, but we all pretended that we don't know who Khrushchev was. So it was a little interesting, um, more than interesting. So I was my growing up in the Soviet Union was I knew I was a descendant of somebody who was very important but 
we were not supposed to talk about it. So the only thing we talk about Khrushchev was at home in the kitchen uh, of how you know that system one day is going to collapse and uh, then Khrushchev will rise up and will take great place in history, which indeed happened after Mikhail Gorbachev, so we owe him a lot. Our family owes him uh, a tremendous amount. Uh, and uh, um, in many ways, I think, and I will conclude my kind of growing up part uh, with, with this, is that um, as horrible, I think, as it was for Khrushchev to be ousted and the family um, continuing uh, with essentially place in, in, in history, place in, in society, because when Khrushchev was kicked out of the Kremlin, also every member of the family lost their jobs. My mother was a journalist and uh, she had she, her husband's name, Petrova, and uh, uh, her name was taken, I mean, she couldn't write anymore because even with her, with her husband's name, there was a fear that uh, she could be recognized as Khrushchev's daughter and God forbid somebody who would read Pravda would think that Khrushchev's daughter is published on the pages of the uh, uh, pristine pages of Pravda. So she stopped being a journalist. Um, other, other members of the family lost their names. I mean, no lost their jobs. But I think what the good thing is that, first of all, Khrushchev wasn't killed. And he himself, when he um, uh, was um, ousted uh, in 1964, uh, before he left the, uh, the room, um, and uh, his last words were, I am really proud that today I am ousted by mere voting because only 10 years before that he would have gone to Gulag or even killed. So that was his great achievement. Uh, and uh, achievement for us is that he didn't, he didn't get killed. We, even they lost the jobs, we didn't lose apartments. Our life was rather privileged nonetheless. But also, and I'm very grateful, I think, to the Communist Party for kicking him out, although I'm sure that probably is not shared by my family members is that because we were a nobody only with a name that was not supposed to be mentioned, we actually became human beings. Because people in power, especially those who come out of um, uh, high positions in the Kremlin, I'm sure you've never met anybody. You've never met uh, Brezhnev's children, you've never met even Gorbachev's children, you've never met Br Yeltsin's children, so the only person you're ever going to meet are the Khrushchev descendants because we are the human beings and so that's our story and my story of becoming hopefully becoming a better human in the United States. Well thanks so much that was so interesting and I want to come back to that a little bit later on when we talk about identity but uh, I want to go to President Lowe and if you could hand him the microphone. Um, the, the question you know uh, Nina said she actually didn't, she never lived in, she never lived in Russia, she lived in the Soviet Union and came to America. And, and, and you're, in a way your story is, is the opposite almost in the sense that you, you, were, you were born in China but you never really lived in communist China uh, or maybe a, a little bit. So could you tell us a little bit more about uh, if you have any memory at all or at least something about the family roots in China and how you ended up in Peru? Well, Shibley, thank you so much for organizing this panel, and I'm honored to be with uh, fellow hyphenated Americans on this stage. If I may preface my short uh, remarks about my background, this topic for me all of a sudden has become very personal. Because last spring, the director of the FBI testified in Congress and said, in effect, that all persons of Chinese descent should be suspect. I was outraged by that. I wrote him a letter and I said, you know, I thought this kind of racial profiling went out with World War II, when Japanese Americans, who were very loyal Americans, died for our country, were interned in camps. Well, two weeks later, I get an invitation to go to a high security conference in the FBI in which I learned or I heard the FBI version of why China is an existential threat to this country. And they may be, but still, the notion that every Chinese American should be suspect is, I find, profoundly antithetical to the values of this country. 
So how did I get to where I am? My father became ambassador to Peru, and, and so um, my older brothers and sisters did not want to leave China. They were going to school. So I was the youngest. They took me along. I was about a year old. And we went to Peru. My father thought, well, you will be able to three year stint and we go back to China, go back to Shanghai. But we were pretty well off, or so I'm told. And then the revolution occurred and we got separated. And my father had to seek political asylum in Peru because if he had gone back, he was serving the wrong party, the Nationalist Party who lost. So for them, in retrospect, it was a dramatic fall in social, some social status from being an ambassador to being refugees with no money. And we opened a little grocery store where my parents worked literally 14, 15 hours a day. And so did I, starting in fifth grade. And so when I got to my senior year, my parents said to me, Wallace, there's not much opportunity for you here. So here's $300 our life savings, and we hope you can end up in the United States. I did not speak much English at that time. I went to the local American embassy, and I found only three college catalogs. One was from Vassar College, and I wrote to them, and they said, well, thank you for your interest, but we're a women's college. <laughs> You see, I didn't read carefully, and I didn't have my dictionary with me. And there was another small school called St. Mary's of the Woods College oh, yeah. in Indiana, and they wrote back and said, this is a college to prepare nuns. <laughs> <laughs> and the third college was a little school in Iowa. And they said, you know, um, well, we can offer you a small scholarship, $500 and uh, we can provide you with a part-time job, because I had no money. Work washing pots and pans every night, three nights, um, to about three hours, seven nights, and you get one free meal. So with the $300 of my parents' uh, life savings, I, a Latasian, Latino Asian, my first language, well, I don't know what my first language is, because I speak Chinese with a Spanish accent, I speak Spanish with a Chinese accent, and I speak English with a combination of both. So I, I arrived in uh, this tiny little school, Grinnell College, we locally called Grim Hell, because it was in the middle of a cornfield. And to make the long story short, that is when I discovered, or I learned about, the heartland of this country. I've been back to Iowa ever since as the provost of the University of Iowa. And whereas I'm not so sure that I fit in politically, I can tell you from experience that the people in Iowa were some of the kindest, most generous people I have ever met. They would drive up their cars to where I was living. I was living in the basement of somebody's house and I was charging $1 to wash their cars. And some of the cars were very clean. And until I realized they were trying to give me a job. And faculty members who took the time to teach me English. And uh, fast forward a little bit, I spent one summer in Sunflower County, Mississippi, doing civil rights work, registering um, people to vote. And that's when, of course, I first experienced what was reading in um, uh, in, in my classes, when two other kids and I, both of them from Chicago, a white guy and an African-American woman and I, in Latation, spent the summer doing voter registration drive, and I remember one day wanting to go to church. I mean, we were innocent. I mean, we were 19 years old, 20 years old, and then we were turned away, and I was shocked. But of course, I've read about it, but it's one thing to read about segregation, it's another to experience it personally. I decided right then and there, I want to go to law school. Anyway, I graduated, I applied to law school. Every single law school I applied to turned me down. So, all right, that's fine. So I applied to graduate school, I got accepted, and pursued a PhD. And uh, in the course of pursuing a PhD, I had 
I spent uh, a year and a half, almost two years, I got a fellowship to go to the University of Leuven or Louvain in Belgium. And I will never forget this. I arrived in my little, this was 1968, I think, you know, the, the Paris Revolution, yeah. where, the, 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 where the, you know, the French students were revolting. And I drive into Leuven in this dilapidated Volkswagen. There were thousands of students out in the square. And they were singing in Dutch, but I could recognize the tune. It was, We Shall Overcome. So I stopped the car because I couldn't go any further. It was blocked by all these students. And I said, so what is this about? You're singing the American Civil Rights Anthem. We shall overcome. He says, yes, we are doing the civil rights demonstration. I said, what are you demonstrating about? Because we want the French speaking, the Walloons, to get out of here. I said, wait a second. You're singing an American integration song in support of separate but equal? That's when I became interested in issues of immigration and cultural differences. Well, then to fast forward, I got my PhD. I never forgot my desire to go become a lawyer. So I applied to the same law schools that turned me down, about six or seven of them, and they all admitted me. <laughs> so, so what happened? What happened was affirmative action came to this country. And so the same schools that turned me down, they all wanted me. And um, let me call you Anna, right? Because you work for um, uh, uh, President Clinton. I have to tell you the story. So I had decided to go to Harvard Law School. So I called Yale to tell them I was turning them down to go to Harvard. And the admissions office said, well, you know, um, have you informed them yet? No, but I thought we, I would inform you first. And they said, would you, we would like you to talk to this young woman student who's an intern on our, in our office. And you know, just, just talk to her. I said, fine. And so this woman comes up uh, to the phone. She's a student there. And she introduces herself as uh, Hillary Rodham. I was mesmerized. I have never met somebody as persuasive as this woman was. <laughs> I immediately changed my mind, turned hard, turned, told Harvard I was not going, and, 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 and changed to Yale. The reason I also mention all of this is because two years ago, I was invited to go back to Yale. When I went to Yale, in the entire law school, there were only three Asian Americans, or three Asians, period. I was one of them. When I went there a year ago, I was invited to give a speech, I was stunned. I was told there was something called the Asian American Law Student Association, and there were 150 students out of 700. How times have changed. And um, so that's basically my background, and it has profoundly shaped my views of the world, and, and uh, I can only say, you fast forward, I'm today the president of a major public research university. Who would have thought that a 15-year-old coming to this country with $200 in his pocket, the life savings of his parents, speaking hardly any English, would be the president of a major public university in this country? <laughs> It is not about me. It is about the opportunities that this country provides. We don't always live fully up to our values, but having lived and taught in South America, in Asia, in Europe, at least we have those values, even though we fall short of them. Well, th this was... This was wonderful to hear. Um, and you know, um, I have known Wallace Lowe practically from the day he and Barbara arrived on campus. Um, and I have never heard this story. And, and that was really kind of a, uh, in a way I feel sad about that because I think um, we all have a story that informs a lot about what we do. Uh, and this came across, and thank you for sharing it with us. I know it's not easy to share personal stories 
uh, for a variety of reasons because we, we want to feel we're just completely professional and, and feel like uh, Nina must have felt it was worked for her when her uh, great-grandfather didn't matter uh, in the Soviet Union or her, her identity. Uh, but these stories do matter. They do inform us. Uh, Maria, um, I know that um, uh, you were born in Bolivia uh, and somehow through a, pa a path took you to the University of Maryland, of all things, to study here. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? Certainly. It's, uh, and thank you for having me here. I feel like I'm totally at home because I uh, studied here. I'm not going to tell you when. Um, but I used to park in parking lot A and uh, run from the Francis Scott Key building to, uh, uh, which is really where I spent most of my time. Um, I love this university. Uh, the impact it had on me uh, was um, life-changing. It was transformative. Um, and um, I think played an incredible role in enabling me to even dream of what I could be. I did arrive in this country when I was 12 years old. My family moved here from Bolivia. Um, I spoke no English when I arrived into about the seventh grade. I think they had us do sixth grade. Again, I'm one of nine children, good Catholic family. Um, none of us were asked if we wanted to move anywhere. You just did what your parents told you. Uh, and when we arrived at the Catholic school, um, I knew two words in English. I mean, we're so badly trained. Um, and there were no Latins there, so there was really no one speaking Spanish. I knew how to say pencil, and the nuns in Bolivia had taught us, I remember, pencil and rubber for eraser. Um, so I would say to the boy next to me, could I borrow your rubber, please? <laughs> this uh, was not the best way to be able to try to integrate as a, as a young sixth, seventh grader. Um, learning the language is one of the most difficult struggles uh, that you have to undertake. And because I arrived right at that time of adolescence, Perhaps the most important thing for me was to assimilate into the American culture, which now we think about how assimilation is really not what we should try to do. Uh, we should not be swallowed up, but the concept of integrating ourselves with our full diverse culture, with our traditions, uh, with what we bring to a, a society uh, that will enrich it as well as enable us to learn from it is, is something you don't realize at the time. At the time, I just wanted blue eyes and blonde hair with all those Irish young kids I studied with, and um, I desperately wanted to belong. Um, everything my family did was wrong. Um, if you're a Bolivian on Saturdays, uh, your mom fixes a huge meal, you lay the, uh, the tablecloth and you sit around the table and you have rice and chicken and all these other things. And I remember coming to my mom after I made a few friends and saying, Mom, you know, they do it differently in my friend's house. The mom just puts a water, just puts a pot to boil and they put hot dogs in there. And then somebody, you know, the kids just come, pick up a hot dog and eat. Why can't we do that? And so, you know, your effort to, uh, to assimilate is there everywhere to, to, to become part of what you are. And it really is a struggle. It's very, you do feel the loneliness uh, as a child or as an adolescent of being in a different place. And you also realize that um, only later, that when you move to another country, our living room in Washington, which is where we moved, might as well have been in La Paz, Bolivia, for years. Because what was happening in our own country, the politics of our own country, the crisis, the conflicts that occurred, were 
the center of our lives. And only really Bolivians and other Latin Americans came through our living room, and this is what we discussed. In 1963, um, Martin Luther King um, was in Washington, D.C., in the Great March of Washington. We had no idea who he was. We did not know any of the issues related to the march. And we didn't care very much. We were much more concerned with what President Ovando at the time was doing to President Barriento. So I think part of one of the factors that is part of being an immigrant is that you, you know so little about the environment that you're in that you uh, you retain that force, that pull, that it still gives you your sense of identity. Um, I went to the University of Maryland, in part because I was one of nine children, and I lived in Maryland. <laughs> and so there wasn't really very much option. My parents, nor we, didn't really know that you applied to schools. So I didn't really apply to anywhere but the University of Maryland. And my parents said, you're a young woman. You're going to the university. You want to live where? <laughs> you live with your family. You live in your house with your mom and your dad. Because it was unconceivable that you would live in a, in a dorm. And additionally, the resources for us were very limited. So I commuted to the University of Maryland. That's why parking lot A is so familiar to me. <laughs> and I, um, and I uh, worked probably 20, 25 hours in order to be able to pay tuition, which at the time which must, was much more commensurate with what you could earn. The University of Maryland for me was a place where I think I started to see the world and to understand it. And what happened to me at the University of Maryland was that I found mentors, I found professors, I studied um, English literature, specifically British romantic literature. Mm -hmm. um, and um, my professors in the English department pushed me and said to me, one of them said to me one time, Professor John Howard, he said, you know, Maria, if you keep your grades up, you can be a teaching assistant here, and uh, you can get your master's here. I had never heard of a master's. I did not know that graduate school existed. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of being able to keep expanding really happened to me here at the University of Maryland. And I was one of those teaching assistants who taught English 101, which you all remember all your English 101 teachers. And, um, and my time here enabled me to develop enough of a, of a sense of self that it also allowed me to enter into my first, into the kind of identity crisis, if you will, that you enter when you belong to two different societies. Uh, who am I? Where do I belong? Um, am I going to live here or am, am I going to go back to my country? Who should I be? This notion that you, you don't really know where you belong. And at the time, as I was finishing my master's, my master's uh, thesis on John Keats, his poetic development, mm -hmm. I um, there was a coup in Chile, and uh, General Pinochet uh, took over the country, demolished a democratic, uh, democratically elected government of uh, President Allende, and, the, and Chile, which was next to my country, went into a period of, um, of tortures, of disappearances, of horrific uh, events, that, made, that stopped me short and made me think, wait a minute, where do I come from? Why am I studying British romantic literature when I am really from Bolivia? And in Bolivia, 80% of the population is hungry and has no opportunity. 
where should I be? What should I do? And this really took me from my beloved British romantic literature to um, the coming from the humanities into the political sciences and economics. Uh, and then I proceeded to study and get another master's in international studies that then allow me to do the work that uh, I am doing now. But the, the, the concept of being an immigrant has remained for me um, as central to who I am. And at some point, I arrived at an acceptance that um, I don't have, that I can provide a great deal to this country and not just feel as if I'm a second-class citizen, and that I can represent the many, many um, immigrants, especially now from my part of the world, especially from Central America, who don't have a voice, who can't speak, um, who suffer illiteracy in their own language and then have to come here. Um, and, and so the issue of, migra of migration and immigration has also become very central to my own life. And I have, I think, developed a sense that when you are given an opportunity to be a president, to be a writer, in my case, to become the first Latina Under Secretary of State in the history of the Department of State, that I have a responsibility. <laughs> and that I am, um, that I am given the opportunity to also provide some sense of leadership, some role modeling, especially to women, and address the issue of gender, which has also been one that I've worked on throughout my life, um, and, and help minority women, immigrants and otherwise, be able to, um, be able to create opportunity to achieve more equity um, and to move forward. So uh, let me stop right there, but I did want to tell you a little bit about the University of Maryland and how important it was Well, it's great, me. Uh, and we'll come back to some of that as well. But, <laughs> so, Abdurrahim, um, I mean, I would like to hear your story, obviously, about uh, leaving Morocco and why and how you ended up in, ultimately, in the U.S. via uh, the U.K. Uh, but I also, uh, I, I hope you could address one of the themes that uh, comes out of all this, which is uh, you are um, a, a visible person in the Arab world. You're an American now. You, your roots are in Morocco. You have a story to tell about how you got here. Uh, but you are, when we sometimes think of immigrants as being a bridge, in a way, your, your voice here in America is being heard back home because of what you do, in, particularly on Al Jazeera, broadcasting in Arabic to not just Morocco, but, but elsewhere in the Arab world. And, um, and in a way, you, um, you, 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 you have to be frustrated uh, with the narrow prism through which uh, people here view the Middle East, but also, in some ways, the way people in the Middle East view America. And so, how, how do you deal with that? Well, I mean, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation, first of all. I mean, the, the fact that I'm here, part of this panel, uh, there's something quintessentially American, I would say, about it, in terms of the recognition that uh, America and Americans uh, give to people like us who came from um, a, a different uh, history and a different geography. Closer, yeah. Uh, um, there's something quintessentially American about us sitting here, um, co having come from a different history and a different geography. You know, the, the journey of uh, an immigrant is always an arduous one. The journey of an immigrant who succeeds in uh, a new country is even more arduous. Um, but as I said, there is recognition at the end of the process uh, for us here. and. There is no recognition of success um, that exceeds the American recognition of success. In other, way, in other words, 
you're not as successful as you should be until you're successful in America. That's the general uh, uh, assumption. Now, I got here, if you allow me to say, since you're asking us yeah. to give this a personal mm -hmm. touch, I, I got here for many different reasons, but I always go back to the origin of the reason, which is my parents. And I have to give them recognition. I give them recognition every single day. My father taught me how to read and write um, by virtue... In, in Marrakesh. In, Mar in, Mar in Marrakesh, yes, Morocco, by virtue of actually taking me to school that first day. I was a little boy. I'll never forget that. We don't forget that moment, any one of us. But you need more than being able to read and write, obviously, to be successful. You need somebody to teach you how to dream. That was my mother's job. She taught us how to dream. And I, my father passed away some 20 years ago. I always, when I go back to Morocco, I, I go and I visit his grave uh, because I just want to remind myself what he did for me. I, my mother, she's ailing now, um, but I call her almost on a daily basis because I want to remind myself of how she taught me to dream. And part of what she taught me to dream about, uh, believe it or not, was actually to come to America when I was a little boy. Now, she had a lot of tools to work with to teach me that, uh, how to dream about that. One of them is that as little boys growing up in Morocco, generation after generation, we were taught, we still are taught, that Morocco was the first country to recognize the independence of the United States uh, from the British crown. Later on, I found out that the Dutch also teach their children the same thing, but that's a different, that's a different, that's a different story. Um, I actually, um, since we're talking about history, I found out later on in life that the story of Morocco with the United States uh, goes even deeper than that. Um, one of the first explorers after the New World was discovered by Christopher Columbus or whoever ended up discovering it. That's a subject for a, a different occasion. But one of the early explorers was actually from the region of Azmour on the Atlantic, on the Moroccan uh, Atlantic uh, coast, and he was sold as a slave to a Portuguese uh, explorer who brought him uh, to the New World. He's, he's known, uh, uh, more commonly known as Estevanico, and I understand he's buried somewhere in Houston, Texas. Now, the other reason um, the, or the other tool that my, my mother had to, to, to work with, she had American soft power. I mean, we watched a lot of Little House on the Prairie, uh, <laughs> uh, Dallas, and you know, all, all those things that can be seen as superficial or negative, or, but they do shape your perception of a particular part of the world, in this case, the United States. But there's a more profound reason uh, which is part of the dream that my mother taught us, which is that my eldest brother came to the United States when he finished uh, high school. He was a young kid, and he was placed with a family in Wisconsin. And you can imagine the kind of stories that he went back to Morocco with from uh, the United States. And that helped uh, um, substantially and practically shape uh, our dream and our perception of the United States and wanting to come to it. And then I found myself in the United Kingdom. I was very young, and at that time, I, I loved the United Kingdom. I, I, I spent many wonderful uh, years there. It's a great country, great culture, great history. But when I went, the United Kingdom was going through a very, very, very rough patch. Nothing was working. Maggie Thatcher had just uh, uh, become uh, prime minister. The country had gone through the Falklands War, or the Malvinas, as the Argentinians, uh, so we don't offend anyone, um, call it. And th nothing was working uh, in the UK at that time. Uh, the health service was not working, the trains were not working, the miners were on strike uh, up and down the country. It was just a, a, a terrible time in the history of the United Kingdom. Uh, many Europeans referred to it at that time as the sick man of Europe. And there was a joke uh, at that time. Maggie Thatcher had become friends with Ronald Reagan here in the United uh -huh. States. And 
the, the Brits were so disaffected. I was following this stuff. All this stuff was percolating inside my head, obviously. The, 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 the Brits were so uh, um, disaffected. They were so unhappy with their own situation that a joke was doing the rounds at that time, saying, what's the difference between the United States and Britain? And the, the answer was, the United States had Ronald Reagan, Johnny Cash, and Bob Hope. <laughs> The UK had uh, Thatcher, no hope and no cash. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, these, these things, you know, they, it, at, at the time, they seemed fleeting uh, in my consciousness or subconsciousness, as the case may have been. But they made me think a lot about, you know, I'm in the UK, there's another world which somebody else had taught me how to dream about getting to. And I was in, I joined the BBC later on, I was on assignment in Kuwait, I got a call from somebody in Boston, uh, I was in BBC radio at that time, I got a call from somebody who was uh, um, in Boston working on a co-production of the BBC in WGBH Boston, and he said, hey Abdurrahim, uh, we have a vacancy in, uh, in uh, Boston, do you want to come? Uh, I said, Brian, I need to think about this, so click, and then I said, what do I need to think about? There's nothing to think about. This is a great opportunity. Let me go for it. So I called him back, and that's how, I, that's how it all happened. That's how I ended up in the United States, initially on secondment from the BBC for a couple of years. And then I went back to London. I remember trekking through Leicester Square one morning uh, after going back. And I looked up, and it was gray, raining. <laughs> Leicester Square was packed. Um, you had to Sounds elbow like your Ithaca. way through the crowds. <laughs> and then I said, what am I doing here? I just left um, a, a city where even when it's snowing, it's sunny, Boston. <laughs> um, and then I, I decided, to, I decided to, uh, to come back. Then later on, I joined Al Jazeera, and I am uh, where I am now. The, the issue is this, for me, the success. Um, the success is, yes, of course, the success is what I'm doing now for Al Jazeera, and, you know, uh, having risen to where I am. But for me, the real success is, as an Arab from Morocco, sitting in the capital of the most powerful nation, maybe in human history, a nation that affects people everywhere in, in the world, sometimes down to their daily bread, certainly does so with, when it comes to the, to, to the Middle East and North Africa. And I'm sitting here on top of this mountain watching history unfold day after day uh, at the crossroads of American lives and Arab lives in North Africa and the, and the Middle East. And some days I wake up in the morning and I, I pinch myself, wow! I consider myself so fortunate that I am in the nation's capital um, observing the crossroads of the Middle East and, and, and the United States. And it's just a wonderful place to be if, to circle back to the point that you were talking about, if you can be dispassionate about observing it. Because if you get emotionally tangled up in the politics of the US and the Middle East, it can be a, a very depressing place to be. But if you can give yourself enough emotional distance from that and just observe it from up here, there's no other place like it. If that's what you call success, that is definitely what I call, uh, what I call success. Well, thanks very much for the story. Um... You know, um, I'm an immigrant too, and uh, uh, I also came to this country uh, with $150, uh, and uh, my parents just had faith uh, that that was going to be enough for me to put me through school. Uh, and, um, and, you know, clearly, like, like all of us, uh, struggle through um, questions of identity uh, throughout. Uh, but there are moments when I felt that 
I belong more than others. Um, and I'm not talking about politically, because we focus a lot on the politics. We're, we're talking about uh, fitting socially, fitting uh, uh, culturally. Uh, and sometimes it's deliberate that, that it happens, the memory. But w when you talked about um, the kind of how fortunate you feel to be on top of the world, essentially, and how fortunate that we could be talking about it in Washington, you and me, talking to the rest of the Arab world from Washington, which everybody wants to hear. Uh, and I did have moments um, throughout my journey when I felt like it was extraordinary, uh, and the first uh, many of them along the way. But particularly when I first um, uh, uh, went to uh, advise the United, the United States mission at the United Nations um, during the end of the Cold, just as the end of the Cold War was ending, um, and uh, was given top secret security clearance. I'm an immigrant. I'm an Arab American. I come from a small village. My family still lives there. And I'm given, given access to the nation's top secrets. I am sitting there behind the United States ambassador to the United Nations at the Security Council, looking at everything that has taken place. And I am accepted to participate in the decisions that were critical at that time, uh, I think that's the moment when I felt I belonged. And certainly, um, there are many other moments like that. But I have to say, just as Wallace Lowe said, this is what makes this country great. And I don't know that there is another place like it. But it's an imperfect place. And it's an imperfect place, and we're going through a crisis right now, including the crisis on immigrants, including the crisis of defining immigrants as the other because that is the worst part of this conversation. It's not just about do you support immigrants or not, because it's given that this country is mostly made up of descendants of immigrants and immigrants, it's an extraordinary thing to create this notion that immigrant is the other against which an American is being defined. And, and that transmits itself in a process. Um, uh, and sometimes, I certainly feel American. If you ask me, what are you first? You know, I'm, I'm a professor, uh, I'm a father, I'm a, uh, a husband, I'm a, a, a Marylander, I'm a, a citizen of the United States, I'm a citizen of the world. Uh, but there are often places when you're in the middle of the debate, when everybody is looking at you strictly by your ethnicity or your origin. Uh, and, and you can't escape that. And sometimes it's unconscious, and it happens in conversations where, uh, despite the fact that I have um, not only served at the U.S. Mission at the U.N., I have actually advised every single administration from George Herbert Walker Bush through Obama uh, with top secret clearance twice throughout those periods. Uh, and therefore, I'm in a position, in a way, to speak as an American, even officially. Uh, and yet, I find myself in places where I go that people think of me as the other, as a foreigner. And we haven't overcome that. It, there's the greatness side, and there is the, the other. And I, therefore, want to use that as a way of asking you, Nina, because um, uh, you are an American, and you are a Soviet. Okay, you're not Russian. You're Soviet. Well, I'm uh, a Russian. No, I, 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 I understand. I'm. I'm. Um, and um, and now we're in the middle of a very tense relationship uh, with Russia, uh, where obviously Russia is being demonized, um, and we're we're looking at Russia through a very narrow prism. Or what we think of Putin, or what we think of Russia is doing in our election. Um, and how does that impact you um, in, in way in how you see yourself in the American conversation or how you think other people relate to you in the American conversation? Uh, it's bound to, uh, to, to show itself up in, in, in the way you're thinking about it. And, and, and in a way, uh, I would like that to be a, a way for you to link up about your new book because the new book, I mean, what happens in the conversations um, uh, when, when there's a crisis, like after 9-11, the crisis toward Arabs and Muslims, where, where Americans are looking at 
big categories of people through a narrow prism, the ter prism of terrorism or the prism of Putin or the prism of prism whatever of it is. Yeah, and, and, and I, I know that this new book in which you're, you're showing the complexity and diversity across uh, Russia, uh, 11 time zones, and you're telling this story. And is this one of the reasons why you were driven to do that, I wonder? Well, a little bit. Thank you. I actually like being the other, uh, <laughs> just be, to remind my fellow Americans that other doesn't mean bad, that Russian doesn't mean bad, the Chinese doesn't mean bad, the fact that um, uh, the fact that there is a whole history of the Cold War doesn't mean, and I'm a Khrushchev, doesn't mean that Khrushchev speaking through me with his uh, anti-American pronouncements because often you encounter this kind of simplistic understanding of, of the Russians, the Chinese, the Mexicans. We've been hearing a lot about uh, people from the White House lately, uh, how they are rapists and murderers because they are not white necessarily. So I, I am, if I may say so, I just actually shove into people's faces that I'm a Russian. And so let them come to me and tell me that Putin is a Darth Vader and you know, how dare the Russians do what they do. And then of course I say, well, let's look at American history, not that I'm defending uh, the president and the Kremlin, but uh, why don't you just get a little bit off your high horse and let's have a conversation about who does what in foreign policy. I was talking about my book recently uh, at the Montclair Book Festival, and I was told, you know, Putin is doing horrible things to women in Russia. There's really, the rights of women are being highly, highly jeopardized, and you know, what are the Russians doing with those abortion laws and whatnot? And it's like, wait a minute, you're an American man, and you're <laughs> telling me that there are problems with women's rights in Russia. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And there are problems with abortion in Russia, in America, you're telling me. So I take pride in having those confrontational conversations. I teach propaganda, so this comes <laughs> naturally to me. Thank you very much. I do argue in something that all of you mentioned. We try not to be ideological. I love Republicans as much as I've loved the Democrats, and Fox News is my favorite TV channel just because you want to know what the other side does. Uh, and I also want to say hello to Maria because my degree was in comparative literature. I was comparing Victorian literature. I was comparing uh, Charles Dickens and Nikolai Gogol, the, the Russian writer, and because Americans was just so wrong about the post-communist reality about Boris Yeltsin and what he does and whether he's a true Democrat. And in a much smaller level, I was not, you know, in any way was thinking that I was saving um, humanity. I felt that I had to write op-eds to explain to Americans how complex Russia is. Not that it helped, uh, but I tried. I did my best. Uh, and uh, uh, the book that I just finished with a colleague, I just wrote with a colleague uh, who is an American writer who lives in Moscow, so we flipped. I'm a Russian living in uh, in, uh, uh, in New York, and my identity, by the way, is a New Yorker mm -hmm. rather than, yeah. than an American, uh, because I am a quintessential New Yorker from East Village. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't drag me away from First Avenue. Mm -hmm. I will not make it above 14th Street. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so that is important to me, and so we went across Russia. What we did, we went from, uh, because as you know, we don't have a map, but Russia is a big country. Uh, one part of it is in, essentially in Germany, what used to be a Prussian city, German city of, Kalin of Königsberg, now Kaliningrad, uh, on the border with Poland and, um, and uh, Lithuania. And uh, another side is on the Pacific Ocean. You remember when Sarah Palin memorably said that she's seeing, yes. <laughs> she's, she's seeing Putin in her backyard. So we went to that backyard and said hello to Sarah Palin uh, right there. So Russia is a big country. And I think what we tried to do is to show that, uh, in fact, 
Russia is much bigger than the Kremlin, and only Americans would think, no offense, uh, that, that the Kremlin takes all, it, it doesn't, Putin doesn't take all, and so we wanted to show that the country is part Europe, on the border with China, on the border with Mongolia, on the border with Japan, on the border with, uh, uh, on the Arctic Circle. And so to show the, 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 um, what it is uh, Russia today under Putin, but also how history plays into a uh, contemporary political environment. And uh, one of the things that uh, when we returned, it took only a month and a half to travel all across Russia, six southern miles all across, uh, big, but it takes, it, it's actually quite comfortable because one of the things that Putin did, he made the country comfortable. Russia, the Soviet Union was never comfortable, Russia was never comfortable, he made it comfortable. There's a lot of problems, but uh, people do live that they uh, live now better than they've ever lived before. Not that it doesn't excuse Putin in any way, and not that one of five Russians actually now want to leave the country. Comfort or not, you want to have a future, and that's what Putin does not offer. He does offer the present with a lot of, uh, with a big dose of the past. But when we came back, uh, people were asking me how it was, and I was thinking, uh, what can I tell them? I mean, there's a lot to tell, but one response that I had is if I were Putin, I think I am God. And he thinks he's God. Um, if you, uh, Wallace, I just want to ask you um, a question more about where we are now here as a nation. I mean, this is a theme that we obviously is coming up in terms of what makes America great, and part of it is its diversity, and, and of which immigrants are part of the story. But we now are facing not only this backlash, and we saw the divide. It's an unbelievable divide in America. But we see the rise of nativism. Um, just to the backdrop of, of, of this diversity issue. And not just here, obviously. We see it, we're seeing it in much, uh, many parts of the world, including parts of Europe. What's the answer? I don't have an answer. <laughs> but I can offer uh, my perspective on it. I would begin with the observations of that uh, French aristocrat Alexis de Tocqueville, who in the mid-19th century wrote that, that classic democracy in America. And I, and I think, you know, when I use the word classic, I don't use it in the sense that Mark Twain used the word, a book that everybody quotes and nobody reads. It's a classic of a book that stands the test of time. And one of the things that de Tocqueville observed about American democracy, he says, what makes America great it's not because somehow America is more enlightened than others. Rather, it's because the people in America come together, recognize the faults of this country, and they try to correct them. Now, when I think about that, and I see the incredible polarization in the country today, from my perspective, throughout the 20th century, up to throughout the 1950s, for example, the model of this country was assimilation. It was a melting pot. People from different races, religions, and faiths, and backgrounds, they were supposed to all meld together. A nation of homogenized Americans. Starting roughly in the 1960s, which is when I came to this country, that paradigm started to shift. It was no longer about assimilation, forgetting about your backgrounds, but rather about multiculturalism, celebrating the diversity of this country. But the question that was never addressed, so, so the metaphor is that of a mosaic. These different tiles all shining brightly and differently, and the question is what holds those tiles together? So if we go from, at least in my view, from assimilation to multiculturalism to today, tribalism. The defining emotion of today is not about hope. It's not about gratitude for what this country offers. The defining emotion is tribal contempt from people with different views. Distrust, incivility, 
In other words, the mosaic metaphor is a mosaic that's breaking down. And the question is, well, what can you do about it? I have no idea what you can do about it, but this is what I would offer. Many countries in the world are united by religion, by land, by faith. What unites this very multicultural, very diverse country are, no, are not those attributes. Rather, it's a commitment to certain core values that define our identity and our destiny. Values that have to do with fairness, equal opportunity, freedom of expression, and you will say, well, these are constitutional values. These are legal values. And I say, no, they're more than that. These are civic virtues that make possible a thriving, pluralistic society. And these are not values that one are, is born with. They have to be taught. And when we have this kind of a polarized country, all I can say is it falls on us as educators to do something about it. I really believe that democracy has to be reborn in every generation. And the midwife of that rebirth is education. Because for example, here at the University of Maryland, we always say that our mission is to prepare students for jobs and for life. What about preparing our students to become responsible citizens in a democracy, who know how to live rightly in a free society? Those are the civic virtues that must be taught, and civics is no longer taught in this country. And let me just conclude by saying this. When I became an American citizen, I went through this ceremony, and I was given this little red, white, and blue pamphlet, Welcome to United States Citizenship. So I was you know, perusing through this pamphlet, and they talk about all these wonderful rights that I would enjoy as an American citizen. But what struck me is not what it said, it's what it did not say. It talked about my rights as a new citizen, it didn't say a word about my responsibilities to my new country. You cannot have rights without responsibilities. You cannot have freedom without obligations. And you look at the you know, United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, they talk about all the rights that we talk about, but they also talk about your responsibility for the general welfare. So how do we inculcate this notion that, yes, we are all different, yet, yes, we have spent 200 and how many years? 242 or so years trying to form a more perfect union. How do we have unity and diversity? One form from many, a pluribus unum. My generation, the baby boom generation, helped diversify this country. It is up to the millennial generation and the Z generation to find out how to unify this country. Unify not on the basis of race and religion and so on and so forth, but on the basis of a fundamental commitment and acting out on these fundamental values which emphasize the oneness of humankind. Thank you. So, uh, uh, we're, we're going to take a few more minutes. I want to uh, have, give a chance to Maria and Abdurrahim to uh, make uh, remarks a, on this as well. Just a brief, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Just a brief remarks because I think you have covered it so very well. Um, and when you were asked, you know, what's the answer? What can we do? I am reminded that I am an immigrant, but I'm also an American. I am from this country. And as an undersecretary of state, I traveled to maybe 55, 56 countries. And I never thought how proud I would be to represent the United States in the rest of the world. Um, and I think part of that reason of that pride was because the administration that I was representing, the Obama administration, spent so much of its time trying to define and to play out the very values that are at the core of what this country is. Uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, the sense of fairness, 
of equity, of uh, dignity of each human being. And a lot of the work in diplomacy uh, engaged us in thinking and playing out those very values. And, these, and, and having a president who recognized that we had so much more work to do in order to be able to attain it in this country. Um, I'll give you one quick example. I, one of the issues I covered was uh, trafficking in persons. Uh, that absolutely horrible way in which young, especially young girls are sold into prostitution uh, and are raped and, and are under bondage just to be able to uh, make money for people. Um, when Hillary Clinton came in as Secretary of State, she said, that's going on in this country too. We are also doing that, whether it's in Brooklyn or in Chicago, and we must recognize that we are also part of the problem and that we have to put in place the things that will help this issue addressed. So part of, part of the solution to the tribalism, to the polarization that we are facing in this country is to elect the leaders that will give us the vision and will path, will provide the path so that we can focus on these issues rather than on the issues that will divide us or will create um, the, the type of uh, discrimination and the type of hatred that is, uh, is being worked on um, under, as we're seeing, uh, uh, under the Trump administration. So part of who we put forth as leaders is in, as those that are going to govern this country presents to the rest of the world who we are. Um, and um, we know, we all travel overseas and we know the kind of questions that the rest of the world is asking about the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and we know the questions they have about, well, tell me a little bit more about the American public that we have this gentleman as president who uh, is insulting every country around the world and is creating a kind of, um, uh, a kind of opening in this country for extremism uh, and for racial uh, inequality and, as you say, tribalism to come forth. So that gives us as Americans uh, much, much um, room to think about. We need to be able to put leaders at every level within this uh, um, system, this uh, democratic system, um, in positions that are going to support the values that this country is based on. And we're not, we don't have it right now. Uh, thank you. I, uh, uh, um, earlier I made a reference to my eldest brother. He's very funny, great sense of humor. I was talking to him uh, yesterday over the phone. I was at the airport in Mexico City. Uh, waiting for my flight. Closer. And, and suddenly he, he heard um, uh, an announcement and he said, where are you? I said, I'm in Mexico. Uh, I said, Mexico, hurry on back to the US before they erect that wall. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the, the, the issue with immigration is that um, you can erect all the walls you want. In the end, uh, people, whether they are starved in their stomach, in their heart, or in their mind for, for whatever they're starved for, they will find a way to get to the, the destination they want to, to get to. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking not just about the wall between the United States and Mexico as an example, I'm also thinking about the Mediterranean between Africa and Europe. When you find young immigrants uh, not just from Morocco, from as far afield in sub-Saharan Africa as the Congo, walked all the way up to the Mediterranean. They've come from Iraqi Kurdistan. They've come from all over the place. And you tell them, these waters are shark infested. And they say, you know what? Still want to give it a chance. And they give it a chance. Sometimes they make it, sometimes they don't. 
And the issue is that the issue, the, 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 the point I'm trying to make is that the issue of immigration, um, it's, it's a multilateral effort. Only a multilateral effort can deal with it because the, the, the problem exists. People want to come, they, they want to leave their countries in mass for a particular reason. You have to address that particular reason, see in what way you can help. You're never gonna find the, the, the magical solution to end that problem, but at least you have to find a way to think about how you can, how you can reduce it. But one thing that we sh I, one thing I personally, I don't wanna speak for anybody else, but one thing that I always remind myself of when I, when I think of immigration, and that is that we have all come from somewhere at some point. You know, the, the, the issue of nativism, we, we have all come from somewhere. You can go as far back in human history as you like. You will always find people who have come from somewhere else. And you know, that helps keep it in, in, in perspective. No one is suggesting that countries, for example, the United States should open up the gates and let people flood in uh, at will. But the issue is that it's very important for people to remember that even people here in the United States, they came from somewhere at a particular point in time. Even the people who are waving the flag of nationalism or white supremacy or whatever flag they were, they originally they came from somewhere. And they came from somewhere, why? Because some of them were starved in their stomachs, some of them were starved for freedom in their hearts, some of them were starved for new ideas in, 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 in their minds. But to just pull the curtain and say, we need to close the borders, you can close them if you like. People will dig under the wall, people will swim through shark infested seas uh, to get to where they want to get, when they feel they have to do it, and people are willing to risk it. If I make it, great, I'll live, and maybe I'll become successful like we have become successful here in the United States. But if I don't, at least I have tried. That's, that's the thinking. But to think that as one government, you can solve it, um, uh, it's, it's not going to work. It's a collective effort. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, well, let me end with, with a thought. Um, and that is, you know, this is obviously a painful moment uh, for America. It's a painful moment for democracy. It's a, a painful moment for the values that attracted us to this country and the values that we have raised our children uh, on. Um, but I, you know, like uh, what Abdul Rahim said earlier, counseled, uh, put the emotions of the moment away. It's hard, especially for us who are activists on this issue, who preach this issue, who live this issue, who teach this issue. It's really hard to detach yourself. But for a moment, uh, detach yourself and look a little bit at the macro level. And what you see is uh, more good. Uh, and what you see is a path forward. Uh, and I say this even in the polling that I presented here, uh, one of uh, which shows this deep polarization the tribalism, the identity politics. But when you probe deeper into what people really think about issues like uh, the issue that we looked at, family separation, where people are not going to fall into this tribalist uh, divide, uh, and even more in some of the issue, on some of the issues that we have pulled over the past uh, several years, in this era where racism uh, seems to be an, uh, the norm, where we've had um, uh, a, a documented rise in uh, racist uh, uh, incidents, whether it's Islamophobic uh, incidents or anti-Semitic incidents or, or anti-black incidents. Uh, there's been a documented rise on those incidents. That seems to frighten us so deeply to think that maybe America is becoming more racist. When you probe deep down, it's actually quite the opposite. Uh, this is a moment where the racist and uh, the, the, the people who are uh, acting are empowered. And what we see is we're, we're feeling the empowerment and the intensity of that fringe minority in America. In fact, what we see exactly the opposite, where actually people are becoming less racist and reacting to this sentiment in an American way. 
and what we've seen, for example, in attitudes to Islam. I've shown seven consecutive polls from 2015 to now, where despite all of the anti-Islamic rhetoric that we're witnessing, all the anti-Islamic incidents that we're witnessing, the sense that uh, this is the era of, anti, of Islamophobia in America, that every single poll uh, showed improvement in the attitudes toward Muslims from the one before. Every single one. And if you compare attitude toward Islam today, they're more positive than they were in 2015 because Americans, in the end, will reject this. And this is a moment, yes, one that we have to deal with, we have to address, uh, but there is a path forward and I think we shall overcome. And I say, all of us who, who have come from different parts of the world uh, and have struggled to be here uh, and uh, have made it by some measures, uh, with all of what was said today and all of what's happening around us in Washington and all of the rhetoric that we hear, this is home and it's a good one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, you're welcome to a reception. We have food and drink, and also, don't forget, the great book by Nina Khrushcheva is out there, for, and a book signing. Thank you.